Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, what is going to be a great conversation for IDA screening series around the film collective. Um, before we begin, um, I'm just going to introduce myself. You're probably used to me at this point, but my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the public programs and events manager here at the International Documentary Association. Um, I come to you uh, on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations in the territory now known as Los Angeles. Um, I wanted to give a brief um, thank you to our, uh, our with sponsor support uh, from IndieWire, uh, along with media support from KCRW. Um, this conversation is part of a 35 film screening series that uh, the IDA is running this fall digitally. So thank you all for making this conversion to the online world with us. Um, we do miss seeing you in person. Um, if you want to um, see any further conversations um, and see what the rest of our lineup is, you can go to documentary.org slash screening series, and I'll let Mara catch up because I know that's a long one. <laughs> um, and then um, the films are available for IDA members only, so you can look more into joining and becoming an IDA member on that site as well. But all of these conversations are uh, available to the general public. Um, so enough of the business. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, our moderator for the evening, um, Tim Grusin, who is the senior U.S. critic at Screen International. Hi, Tim. Oh, there we go. Now you're unmuted. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me. I'm, it's a real pleasure for me to get to uh, do this panel about Collective, which I think is one of the best films of this year. And it gives me great pleasure now to introduce the director of Collective, Alexander Nenu. Um, Alexander, hello. Thank you so much for being with us. And as I said, I think this movie is remarkable. And the first time I saw it was uh, before the pandemic, early this year. A lot has changed, but before we get into that, I'm always curious how documentary filmmakers um, get their starts. And my understanding is that you actually um, started with a theater background. I wanted to talk a little bit about that and also sort of hear how you went from theater into documentaries. Right, so I mean, first of all, thank you very much for, for hosting uh, this and for screening the film. Um, right, so uh, around my 20s, for sure, I, I, I prepared myself for, for film school uh, and worked a lot on, on short films in all kinds of positions. Uh, and uh, then I got into theater and uh, worked in theater. Uh, mainly, I, I, I worked uh, alongside uh, what was my mentor, uh, Peter Zadek, who was one of the great uh, German directors. So I learned a lot in theater. I, I think most of my, my um, let's say, artistic upbringing w w was uh, there. Um, I went to film school, like, many of us and um, wanted to become a fiction film director, actually. Um, and then in film school, I mean, being, being always very, um, you know, from, from the theater work on, very preoccupied with authenticity and, you know, what's authentic about, about actors that, you know, how do you bring the, the, uh, the real human being, the character out of an actor on stage. That was also what I was preoccupied with uh, in film. And then um, during documentary class, every Monday, we would watch um, you know, the whole history of documentary um, and we were lucky to see um, everything on print. Um, I discovered for myself, for sure, a lot of European documentaries like the, the British movement um, uh, and then uh, the British New Cinema. And uh, when I discovered actually, um, you know, Robert Drew and um, when I saw uh, also Salesman, um, it, it was something, where something happened and I realized, you know, you can do films with real people and they can become bigger than life and you can, 
you can build an, a narrative within a documentary film that is really um, communicating with the audience, maybe even stronger uh, than a fiction film. And from there on, in a way, I, yeah, it was like a microbe that I got and, and I started to make my first documentary about theater, which was also an observational documentary. And I started to develop my own approach to, to observational uh, documentary filmmaking and uh, I moved back to, or I, I didn't move back to, but I came back to Romania after many, many years uh, because I lived in Germany, uh, but was born in Romania and I left Romania when, when I was 10. And uh, here I, I encountered the first story that I did here, uh, a homeless man who was actually an artist who did pop art uh, during the 70s and 80s without ever being in contact with pop art because the communist system was closed. He didn't have access to that art. So in parallel with, with the Western art, he invented in a way pop art, but kept it in a basement because everybody was laughing about him, this incredible collages. And uh, I was lucky to meet this man um, the moment he was discovered by a gallery owner. Uh, and from there, I, I developed on my, I developed further my way of shooting observational, did Toto and his sisters, uh, my next um, observational documentary. And then I did Collective. Because um, we're moving up to the fifth anniversary of the actual fire at Collective, because it was the end of October of 2015. Right. And, and the documentary starts off by giving a little bit of context in terms of what that meant, not just in Bucharest, but in the country in general. But I was sort of curious in terms of you living in Germany for a while and then moving back uh, to Romania. In terms of providing more context about, obviously this was a tragedy and a preventable tragedy in a lot of ways, but it seemed like it spoke to something deeper, a deeper sort of unrest and dissatisfaction in the Romanian people in terms of their government. The documentary talks about it a little bit, but just in terms of that context about had there been other events that had led up to this moment that made people sort of protest in the streets or was this sort of the first thing for Romanians? Um, no, there were during the years before, like two or three years before, there were already demonstrations, but really small ones because there were a lot of um, corruption scandals about uh, the, the uh, government and uh, the prime ministers that were uh, in charge and their ministers and and so there was something cooking, let's say. Uh, and regarding the government that was in place when the fire happened, they really had a lot of scandals already in place about their corruption, uh, about their, the fact that they were, I think the prime minister, uh, we, we learned that he plagiarized his, uh, his PhD like they all did in the end, what mm -hmm. we learned. <laughs> Uh, so we knew that they are actually a bunch of incompetent um, thugs that uh, took over the government of the country. And that was, in a way, the spirit. But the people didn't really take the streets. So the fire and the fact that the switch where people realized, wait a minute, corruption, that's not, we're not talking only about money. Corruption, and if the government is corrupt, that and authorities are corrupt, that means that death is a result of it because the, the, the society doesn't function anymore. And the moment you are um, dependent on, on the function of the society, uh, it's, it could be that it's really in a situation where it's about, you know, staying alive or not. Uh, so in a way for me coming back from Germany and growing up with the German history and knowing so much about 68 and having a lot of contact with people in the cultural world that were part of the 68 movement. I always expected in Eastern Europe something like that to happen before things can really change, like a young generation refusing and rejecting their parents' generation and the world they, in a way, build up. Uh, and it felt, at that moment, it felt like that's going to happen because it happened in Hungary before when Orban uh, closed the, the university, um, the Soros-funded university. Um, and there were signs from Poland. And so 
we felt like something is happening here. Uh, the young generation is really like taking the streets and something will change. So that was the first thing when, when the demonstration started, I, I knew I should do something. And I started filming, but I, it, there, was, there were so many layers to it. And it was such a chaos in the beginning that we, or I didn't really know how to get hold of it, how to, how to make an observational documentary about it. Because from my understanding of other interviews that you've done, in terms of how you approach your films, it really is trying to figure out a subject that you're interested in and then trying to figure out a way in. And, and eventually, it seems like you were introduced or you discovered these journalists from uh, the Sports Gazette as an intro. There's so many questions I have about the, the Sports Gazette because it's so fascinating. But were you aware of of Keatlin, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, were you aware of him? Were you aware, of, yeah. were you aware of the work that he and his newspaper were doing or did someone introduce you to them? How did you get introduced to him and his paper? Yeah, so actually um, I was aware, but the, the thing is that when we decided that we have to do a film about what's, what's happening, uh, the decision that led up to that was really that we understood the manipulation. I mean, it was really that the whole country was in grief. Um, it was really that national tragedy since the revolution, the biggest national tragedy. And these people just came out every two hours in front of the uh, television uh, and the whole press just failed. They just repeated what they were saying, that they can manage the situation, that the healthcare system is prepared, uh, that they know how to treat 180 burn patients and that they don't have to be uh, flown out to other European countries that have burn units. Right. So basically, it was a very populistic, nationalistic um, speech they gave all the time. And we knew that. And so we, we built our own investigative team out of journalists led by the, the co-author of the, of the film, the, of the concept, let's say, of the dramaturgy, Antonetta Oprich, who's uh, a journalist herself. Um, and we interviewed many people, like in all directions. Uh, parents, doctors, politicians, uh, just to understand where there could be a character to follow for an observational uh, film that we try, you know, how could we understand what's happening inside is through the eyes of a character. Uh, and then Katalin Tolontan and his team at the, at the Sports Gazette were the only ones who started to reveal the lies. Uh, and that's when Antonetta said, like, he's the character. If he would let you film with him, that's the guy. And he was famous in Romania because he was the most feared investigative journalist, but in the sports world. So he really, before uh, that, he brought down sports ministers that had to go to prison. He brought down uh, the big players in the football world that did corruption with buying and selling football players. So he was a very you know, dodged and feared uh, journalist. And Antonetta said, he is the character, but it's too bad that he will never let us film him. You know, and I said, who knows? Let's see, let's, let's you know, right. can you provide me his phone number? And uh, I called him, we had, we had a first meeting with our team and, and, and them, and um, they said, no, no way. You can't come with a camera into a newsroom. It's a, it's a newsroom, it has to, stay a protected space. The journalists and the information has to stay protected and the whistleblowers. So, so sorry, no way. So in terms of gaining his trust, you're doing observational filmmaking and you're filming yourself. I imagine yes. this is something where you have to really sell yourself in, in terms of them being able to trust you as a person. I'm curious about that process of did it mean showing him your other films or kind of doing a dry run, sort of explaining how you would work in the newsroom? How did you turn the tide to get him to say, okay, well, I'll let you film in the newsroom? I think there were uh, more aspects to it that, that uh, turned the tide. First of all, he realized that our team is investigating also very good and we had also our sources inside the system and that we are really serious about it. Um, for sure, he also knew about me because in Romania my films are known and uh, he, he knew who I am. Uh, but still, being a journalist, 
and not trusting anybody, he thought that, that's very funny actually, because they told me that later, because they said the next meeting after you left was like, they were saying like, incredible how sophisticated the Secret Service became. They're sending now a, a, a film director to spy on us. That's smart of them. <laughs> so that was their first reaction, because they were already, for sure, on to revelations that they knew will come out. Yeah. Uh, but then, no, but then the tide was turned and he called me and said like, you know, we are onto something. It could be something big, but we don't know. We could be really wrong. Let's try to do it. Uh, the thing is that he and his team imagined that I will come with a lot of lights and cameraman. And so it was for them also a surprise and also a good thing that I was really with a very small team uh, two people to three people maximum, I film, small camera. So that, I think that made them re more relaxed in, ter in terms of the, of the process. And that also helps to make people forget that you are there, you know, when you spend a lot of time with them. And then, yes, it is observational filmmaking for me is really about human relationship captured through a lens. So that's, that's how I define, in a way, my work. I see myself more as a street photographer. So I, I establish a relationship to the characters. Uh, I, I, I choose to, to be interested in because I'm, you know, I choose them because I'm really curious about their work and their life attitudes, most of all. Um, and then once people see that you are not judging and that you are genuinely interested in, 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 in them without any preconception, they start to relax. And that is also something that I took from, from theater, you know, where you have time to communicate with actors non-verbally, where you have time to understand how communication really works. And that's something that I took with me and I naturally apply here. And it, it's, it happens very fast that they just, you know, they can be themselves. And then they don't even know exactly what I'm doing because they don't really get it, what I'm really doing when I'm moving around the room silently and capturing things. Because, you know, as you were saying, working in theater, you're working with actors, you're developing characters, and obviously documentaries are real subjects, but in a way they become characters. In terms of filming the newsroom and filming him specifically and seeing how he worked, while you were filming, are you getting a sense of, in terms of the, the final edit, in terms of figuring out who is this person? What makes him tick? Who is he as a character? Are you thinking about that even as you're filming or do you just try to not think about that and just let the moments happen in front of the camera? Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's a mixture because I'm also editing and <clears throat> for sure as an editor, you always, you start a day that, you know, you start a filming day and your head is automatically producing the drama, you know, like what's the dramaturgy of the, that 10 minutes? What's the dramaturgy of that hour? What's the dramaturgy of the 10 hours that I worked today? Uh, for sure, but most of all, I, I try to work uh, without any expectations. So I really try, like a street photographer, to find, you know, to, to, to capture the moments and the feelings that I have during what I observe, to capture them. Uh, and that's something that, uh, when I was the first AD on, on fiction films, I, I uh, had a chance to, you know, to talk with the DOP who, who was really great. And I asked them like, when the director is doing the blocking, what, what are you actually doing? What's your job there? And he said, the only thing that I'm doing is I'm just looking for the, for the actor and his emotions to find the best uh, framing for his emotion. And that's actually what you do in observational filmmaking. You're just living intensively, intense, uh, the intense moments with them. And then you just try like a street photographer to shape out the image that describes the character, the feeling, and the relationship that happens in front of your camera between the people. Um, at least, you know, the first half of the movie, for people who don't know much going in, they might assume this is going to be, you know, uh, like an all the president's men or, or something like, like or spotlight, a, a journalistic film, and it obviously is. But then it radically shifts halfway through and we're introduced uh, to Vlad, who's this new health minister, very idealistic, very young, ambitious, wants to sort of change the system. 
in terms of you doing an observational documentary, the shift that happens from sort of one principal character to another principal character about halfway through the film, I'd love to hear about the decision of knowing now this is the subject, now this is the person I want to follow. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the minister that the journalists through their investigation brought down was also a technocrat minister. So he didn't, you know, he didn't stand up to the principles that he put forward as technocrats to be open and fair and so forth. And then we heard that they want to do better and they bring in this uh, activist in a way. He was, he was for sure, I mean, he was working in a bank in Vienna, but he was a patient activist. We knew about him, we heard about him because he organized this network of friends that were just with their own money bringing uh, cancer treatment and medicine that was not existing in Romania to, to cancer patients. Uh, so, and then he has this, had this camp for cancer kids in the backyard of his parents' place. So it seemed like a genuine good person. And I thought like, okay, maybe that's the chance to get inside of the system because for sure it's a, it's a, it's a storyteller's dream, you know, to just switch sides and really see the, the, the whole fight that you've been following from the other perspective. Uh, it was a challenge because, you know, it felt like, okay, we have already in a way part of a good film that will take longer. So how do you switch characters in the middle of a film? It's not gonna work, it's never gonna work. So everybody was like, mm, okay, you know, you do what you think, but you'll see. And I said, said like, no, my gut feeling is it, it, it can work. I don't know how, but it can work. Uh, so I approached him. After a week or so, I, I managed to, to, to get a, a meeting with him. And the luck was that I met a very young man. He was 32, 33, he was younger than me. Uh, a normal human being being appointed into this position. And he said, you know, one of my, or one of the main goals of me and my team that I brought in, like re really young people that came from all, all over the world, uh, is to become transparent. Healthcare is about the health of people and it is their right to know exactly what is happening inside the Ministry of Health. It is their ministry, their health, they're entitled. That there's no reason at all to have secrets inside the Ministry of Health. It's just the least ministry to have secrets in. It's, uh, and then we made this arrangement. I said, okay, good. I explained to him what I did until up to, to his appointment, how I work. I encouraged him to watch, if he had time in between, <laughs> to watch a bit of my, of my um, film, of my former film, Toto, to see how I work. Uh, and then the deal was, I'm going to film here uh, in this highly corrupt ministry. So please never tell me in front of other people to switch off the camera uh, because that might encourage other people. The only deal we have is that when people come in and don't want to be filmed, I will ask them if they are fine with it. If they are not fine with it, for sure, we won't film them. Uh, but if people don't reject it by themselves, we just keep filming. So. That was the only deal. And, uh, and he was very courageous to trust me because I could have, you know, you have all the power in the editing. You have all the power. You can do whatever you do by portraying, a, you know, portraying him very weak. And I, I took my freedom to portray him uh, very objective with all his failures and uh, his goodwill, but still with, you know, when he comes in the first time, his first speech. He just is just repeating what the system put into his lap to repeat. Uh, and, you know, I told him, you know, it will be, I will be as objective as I can be and through my own perception as a storyteller, what I think people have to see. Um, and he accepted that. He never saw the film until it was finished. With both of your subjects, did you ever get the sense that either of them were self-conscious or trying to kind of win your favor because they knew that you controlled the edit. I'm always sort of curious when documentary filmmakers are doing observational work like you're doing, and it's so intimate. And to be on camera that much and to see flaws and to, and to fail in front of the camera and knowing that it's gonna be recorded with either of them, were there ever 
did you ever get the sense they were trying to ingratiate themselves with you to curry favor so that you would portray them in a nice light? Did you ever experience that with either of these gentlemen? Uh, no, not, not, not with them. I think I had that with, for sure, Kathleen being such a, you know, public person in a way and, and uh, being in control of his investigations and trying to stay in control and so forth. Uh, it is always more complicated, for example, to, to work with grown-ups than with kids, right? And then what I learned through, through the last films is that the higher you get into, into the hierarchy of society, the harder it is to work with people because we have so many masks on. If you film, you know, with people that have nothing to hide yeah. and have nothing to perform for, um, once they understand that you don't judge them, it's just such an open relationship. But the higher you get into society, people are not really, you know, we all use masks all the time. So your job becomes then to see how you can penetrate these masks and how you can make these people relax. And it happened, I mean, even, even Catalin said at one point, you know, for sure he became more nervous and nervous because he understood like, it's not gonna take one week, two weeks, one month. It's gonna take several months that I'm there with them. With them. And that helps because then they relax. And there was a point where he was saying like, you know, I won't, you know, I'm not the best character on camera. You will see it won't work. And I was very frank and I really said like, you, you know, just do your job, let me do mine. And from there, it was like a very clear, like, okay, good. Let's trust each other totally and fully. And it, it's, yeah, then he relaxed. And obviously there's sort of a, a third subject in the film, um, uh, Teddy, I believe. Uh, Teddy, yeah, Teddy, yeah. yeah the, the, the burn victim. And I was really curious because that story sort of weaves through. Um, and in, as a viewer, it felt that you were wanting to remind us of the actual victims so that we would never forget the people who had actually gone through this and, and in this case had survived. But to think of all of those victims, was that something that, as you said, you're sort of editing as you're filming anyway, did you sort of know that you wanted to have that perspective as part of Collective as well? Yes, from the very beginning. I mean, it was clear that uh, that the victims and the, the relatives and parents have to be part of this story because it is, it, it, in the end, it's their story, right? Uh, but at the same time, I knew that the the pain um, is is always quite similar. So my intention was to to show the complexity of society and how things work and how private lives are affected by false information or by wrong decisions and how journalists play into this relationship between the power and the people so for that i knew i have to make space for other layers and really realize then at a certain point that actually teddy is really uh, um, the symbol for all victims that survived and the parents of Alex Hoja, uh, who by the way, it was his birthday today, the, the, dad, the dad boy, um, the, their grief and the pain of parents that lost a child because somebody lied to them and that knew that they could have rescued their son and they tried to rescue their son, that pain is, is so deep uh, that it belongs to all the parents that lost uh, that, that lost a child. There's no, there's no, not much diversity. In it. Sure, there, there's a strong diversity in the individual lives behind this, these people. Uh, but this pain is, yeah, I think one, one is enough to understand what um, these people are going through. In, in terms of, was, was it hard to convince uh, Teddy? Um, was that in terms of those conversations and explaining kind of what the film was about, what was that easy or, or what was it that? It was, what, what helped a lot is, uh, um, is one, um, one team member, uh, Mihai Grecha, who, who came on to the team. He was friends with the band. They shared the studio. And he was also doing, he was a documentary filmmaker himself. And we, 
I knew him because they asked my uh, advice for, for a film he was working on. And then I heard he was in the club. So he was actually filming with, with four other cameramen. He organized the concert because it was the first concert for the, for the band after they signed on with Universal. Uh, and actually the footage we see in the film in the beginning is from one of their cameras. Oh. Unfortunately, two cameramen didn't survive. They just came for Mihai there to film it. And Mihai also uh, nearly died. Uh, and he was in coma for over a month. And when he woke up, I just, out of, I had a gut feeling just to walk one day into the office of, of a friend, an artist, uh, Dan Perzhovsky, who is actually pretty famous. He's had also at the MoMA uh, uh, exhibitions. And I, I didn't know why I walked into the, his office. He was uh, quite next to my, my office nearby. Uh, and there was Mihai alive and telling him the, his story. He was just out of coma since two weeks. And I, I, I sat down, listened to his story and said like, Mihai, listen, I started a project. I'm, I'm making a film about this. So do you want to join the band? And so he joined the band and, and that helped a lot uh, for the victims and the parents to, to, to gain their trust because for sure, there was so much media attention. There were so many journalists trying to, to, you know, to, to grab their emotions and put them immediately on, um, on TV that it, wouldn't been, it would have not been so easy to, to gain the trust if Mihai wouldn't have been part of the team. And then Mihai learned to do sound. And so he be, became then also the sound man. So and w was with me when he was not in therapy. I, because when I think about collective, one of the things I think is a real compliment to you in terms of what you've done with the film is that there are a lot of twists and turns in the film. Uh, if this was a feature film, you would talk about it being sort of this white knuckle thriller in terms of all the different kind of plot things that happen. And what I think you do really well, Alexander, is that there's a real, you were talking about emotion just now, and the movie is very restrained it really doesn't kind of lean into the twists and the shocks and the surprises. I think about sort of the Romanian new wave and all of those films, they're often very stripped down and almost that they're very much about sort of subverting sort of an audience expectation for cheap excitement or cheap thrills. It's about something else. It's like a procedural quality in those fiction films. And watching Collective, I thought about that a lot as well. In terms of sort of deciding tone, and telling the story. I'm really curious about how you decided how much is enough in terms of displaying these twists and sort of putting the audience on the ride that they're gonna go on. Um, I mean, it's, that's an editorial process that takes time. I mean, first of all, it takes time to just learn to take steps back and, you know, to not see the story through the perspective, emotional perspective that one had while shooting it. Uh, and then what I, what I always do is, I, I'm very much interested in, in evoking thought and emotion with the cut. And I think that the off-screen movie um, is the movie that I'm always looking for because I, I think that a film has to be a very personal experience with every viewer. And I try to I try to figure out with uh, with when the story is moving on and you know what the audience thinks and feels at a certain point and when there is enough so that they just identify and have their own projections and their own inner uh, you know cinema going going on. So I think we just have to trigger with storytelling things. You know, we just have to. We don't have to, to go too far or with emotion. As I, I told you about emotion before, you know, I think there are emotions that we all carry in us. So we just need to trigger them and l let the viewer fill them the void and then it becomes his film. Uh, and that's what I try to do in editing, just to, um, to try to, you know, to, to, to try to understand where the viewer might be at and how that goes together with what I want to say and where I said enough so that he can fill the next thing. And in that process, I 
you know, I have a, you know, I, I work with the people in my office, even with the accountant. I bring everybody in with screen and I, I, I listen to everything. And the most important actually during the screenings is not what people are saying afterwards, but I try to feel sitting next to them what they're really living through. And that's also why it takes a lot of time to, to shape such an editor. It's always longer than a year. I mean, this was one year and four or five months at least. And obviously, you know, the, the world changes in a year and four months. Romania changes. In terms of what happened uh, with the government after the elections, did that shape in any way the edit in terms of the story that you told or the perspective that you had in shaping what collective was going to end up being? Um, it's hard to say because we kept on filming longer than what we see in the film. And we really kept on filming through the next government that only after a week tried to change the penal law and to legalize corruption. Then we had even bigger demonstrations in the streets and we were all taken by it. We, we kept filming. And at a certain point I, I realized like, okay, so the whole country is like upside down, but I'm not following any more of my characters. It's just like I'm going with, it's a, it's a, it's a new film already. And then we stopped. So after six months, I think, uh, and then it took a while for sure to get rid of this whole um, emotion in, in which the, the, the country was and really concentrate on, so what, what was I interested in? I wanted to see how people react to power, how people react to responsibility and what is the attitude of people. And that was also the, uh, also for me, coming back to my immigration, coming back to Romania, that is for me actually the optimism that in a, in, in a rotten world in a way, we see people that are really, as we say, mensch. You know, we see really good people yeah. that dedicate their uh, work and their life to the community they're living in. And for me, as an as a constant emigrant, in a way, uh, I never identif really identified with any society, I, and I was never really part of it. I mean, even in the theater, we're just you know, you were with your band, and we were all people from all different cultures and and uh, religious background. So we were not part of the society. And here, when I felt this, this movement after the fire, I thought like, oh, wow, there's this dedication to the community you live in. Like how, I wanted to understand how do people, how are people that really live and dedicate their life for, to the community? And I think that the whistleblowers for me were the biggest lesson, you know, because one woman, the whistleblower changed the whole course of 2016 in Romania because she had the courage and he, she really risked to go to the journalists, reveal the bacteria thing about the deaths in the hospitals. And then from there, the journalists found out through other whistleblowers also the, the dilution. So one person can change society. It's, but for sure, we need journalists. So if, if this is the age of fear, it is for sure also the, the age of the rebirth of investigative journalism. Well, it's also, I mean, this is mentioned in the film that it did take a, a sports publication to break this story. You talked a little bit before about that they'd had a reputation of breaking big sports stories. Was the, for lack of a better way of describing it, the mainstream media just too lazy, too complicit that they weren't breaking these types of stories that they required the Sports Gazette to actually kind of follow the story. What was, why were other journalists just blind to this? Uh, I think, you know, we have in Romania, the whole, uh, you know, the whole palette of, of journalists from, you know, the ones controlled by the Mughals and to our, we have our own Fox News that you also see in the film. Uh, and we have really good investigative journalists and all failed. It was the, this emotion of this national tragedy that everybody wanted to help, everybody wanted it to be good, everybody. So that's the moment, the, the moment of trauma was the moment that the uh, authorities and the corrupt doctors and authorities and politicians could misuse. Everybody was in a way traumatized. And, and the team around Toronto were the, were the first ones to wake up and say like, wait a minute, no, 
these are all lies. Every single thing that you're saying are lies. We're gonna invest, investigate it. And their luck was that nobody took them seriously because they were sports journalists. You know, the, the doctors said, okay, uh, the, there, there are some stupid questions and they'll go away. But they didn't go away. When you're making a film like this and you're spending so much time in the, uh, deciding ultimately what this thing is gonna look like, I'm curious how you decide who the audience is. Are you thinking about Romanians? Are you thinking about the international community? Who did you feel like you were making the film for? No, I, um, I never think about only a, a local uh, audience. I, in my film, in my, in my uh, head, it's always very mixed. And, and here I think it helps that I lived in, in, in several cultures and, and worked with, with different uh, uh, people. So I never have an uh, an expectation of uh, okay, that's a local story it should be understood by these people, you know. So no, in my head, it's always uh, nationless, cultureless uh, audience, and I deeply believe that the film has to be as strong for the university professor as as for the I don't know bus driver or you know. I I, I really think. Film and art has to work for, for everybody. It's, it should never be just an elite um, thing. When the, when the film kind of comes to its conclusion and we find out that the Social Democrats are going to win pretty convincingly, my two questions are, number one, at the time, was it pretty apparent? Like that was not a surprise that they were going to win. And then the second question is, my understanding is that the, the Social Democrats were essentially an offshoot or a new version of essentially the Communist Party um, in Romania. And has it, in terms of how the government now is in Romania, I'm curious um, how things are there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, I think what was in the air was that they might win again, because as we see also in the film, their campaign was very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And their campaign was mainly directed uh, towards uh, the character in the film, towards Vlad. They understood that he represents that that has to be crushed. That said, the Technocrat government and its prime minister were uh, disappointing because they were there because the street wanted something new. And in the end, they didn't really bring something new. They just brought some silence for a year. And uh, that disappointment uh, most of all young people felt, and they lost any belief in politics, which in the meantime changed, by the way. Uh, so in a way we felt it will be, they will win, they are just too powerful, they really have the country in their hands in 30 years, and, um, but not, we were, I think nobody was expecting that result. It was, it, it was somehow too much. Um, but then, because they did so much bad things after the election, so after our film ends, and because, you know, a society always seems to need a, the, the, the learning curve of a society is always longer than that of a, of a single person. Um, and so for the next election, two years later, or last year, we had the European elections, where you, we elect the European Parliament and there the outcome was surprisingly people went to vote people understood they have to act uh, and I think they lost over 20% then um, and in the meantime we also have a very new a very new a fresh new party made of people that come out of private businesses young people that took things into their own hands and said like if we want to change something we really have to get into politics, there's no other way because it's only them in politics. So we have to get implicated. Uh, and Vlad also joined this uh, party and they ran with the party now in the local elections for the mayors and won a lot of them, including the Bucharest mayor that was won uh, by them. And uh, Vlad is now the vice mayor of Bucharest who will take care of hospitals and education. It's nice to hear that sort of happy ending epilogue, I have to say, because it's, it's hard 
as I said, the first time I saw the collective was early this year, and I could not help but think about, though the governments are different, I couldn't help about thinking about the outcome with Brexit or with Donald Trump's election here in the US or what happened in Brazil. I am assuming you've been asked this a decent amount of, from making this film, but in terms of thinking globally and other governments and other countries and how they how elections have turned out in other places. Do you see any commonalities or is each country's government its own separate entity? No, I see them. I mean, just to uh, uh, what I said before, because that this new party and blood won now, I mean, we can feel a wind of change. Uh, I have to be honest with you here. I still want to see them, uh, how they do things. So for sure, it's a really good outcome and, you know, uh, they're the proud about the fact that they do it, but let's see how they manage because the system is not so easy to to fight and they're human beings. Let's see how many of them will stay strong and uh, vertical. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's, a fan, it's a fantastic point because young idealists go into a system, there's no guarantee of what will happen. But, but anyway, right. sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, yes, I think there is a pattern globally because the, the fact is also that that connects to the discussion we had before about what I think the audience is. While we were shooting, we lived through all the shocks, Brexit, Trump, uh, and while we were shooting, I, I, I remember that I, I realized that the story we were telling about the populists uh, in Romania and how they destroy systems, how they destroy institutions, how they replace professionals with um, uh, with incompetent people, that it that suddenly it's happening all over the world. So there is a movement of people that voted against the establishment. I mean, we have to be very honest here that it's not. I don't condemn the people that voted that way, because it was a vote against an establishment and against a gap between rich and poor that is wider and wider. And then it's easy to get tricked by, by, you know, be it an Orban in Hungary, be it a Trump in the US, be it Bolsonaro in Brazil. It's very easy to get in, uh, tricked in, uh, here. But at the same time, now after we had the experience, we have to understand that we have to find another way. We cannot just vote for the extreme opposite that is just promising. Um, it's not gonna work and the danger is so high because these people, most of them are wicked and come actually from corrupted businesses or uh, from a very corrupted background. And as we have seen it in Romania, when the social Democrats came back, the first thing they do is they destroy the, the, the judicial system. That's the first institution. And then they take them down one by one. And they know they have four years most of the time until they get to the institution that takes care of the elections. And then there they, re in Romania, for example, you know, they replace the people that take care of the IT department. They replace the people. So they really bring in all their people and it's a very good plan they follow. Uh, and for sure, that's the thing because maybe 30 years before, you know, you could vote left or right or Democrat or Republicans just to punish the other side that, that uh, forgot about their mission towards the citizens. But in the meantime, it's all much more dangerous and having also states like Russia interfere because we have the same here, you know, they're buying the, the press, uh, they're interfering uh, with, with the politicians uh, and are, are paying them bribes in order to get several laws through. Uh, it's a very complicated world we're living in. And that's why I think journalism is so much needed now. And not only journalism, but the journalist. I think the only way of trusting the, 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 the news or trusting information of quality is to know who the person behind it is, the integrity of the person behind it. I think that's very true and very well said. Um, I want to thank you so much, Alexander, for the time. And again, congratulations on Collective. It is, it's a remarkable film. I've seen it twice now. I look forward to seeing it again. So thank you, oh, very, wow. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the time and thank you everyone for watching. Um, stay safe and thanks a lot for watching. Thanks a lot.
Thanks.